It, I've changed hotels due to a lack of Wi-Fi. <laughs> while my wife glared at me the entire time. <laughs> Hosting and bandwidth provided by the Blue Box Group. Check them out at bluebox.net. This podcast is sponsored by New Relic. To track and optimize your application performance, go to rubyrogues.com slash new relic. This episode is sponsored by Code Climate. Raise the visibility of quality within your team with Code Climate and start shipping better code faster. Try it free at rubyrogues.com slash code climate. This episode is sponsored by SendGrid, the leader in transactional email and email deliverability. SendGrid helps eliminate the cost and complexity of owning and maintaining your own email infrastructure by handling ISP monitoring, DKIM, SPF, feedback loops, white labeling, link customization, and more. If you'd rather focus on your business than on scaling your email infrastructure, then visit www.sendgrid.com. Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode 141 of the Ruby Rogues podcast. This week on our panel, we have David Brady. I am emotionally 12 years old. James Edward Gray. I can't be back. Good morning. <laughs> Josh Susser. Hey, I made it. Good morning. I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv. Uh, I just want to let you know that I updated the details on Rails Ramp Up. So if you're looking to learn Ruby on Rails, go check it out, railsrampup.com. We also have a special guest, and that is Ron Evans. Hi, everybody. Glad to be here. Um, I don't think the call thing worked, though, because I can only see one eye of Ron. He doesn't have a whole face. We didn't get the whole Ron. Take the ring off, James. He can see you. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say. It is a blue eye, not a red eye. Thank you very much. <laughs> the Although fire. it is the eye of Ron, which is very close to Sauron. <laughs> yeah. Sauron has heterochromia? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it's, you just realize, oh, whoops, one of the RGB cables is not plugged in. Oh, no. <laughs> We're doomed. Like seven of our listeners right now are Googling heterochromia. So, here's a hint. Do an image search. It'll be much cooler. <laughs> the others are not Googling because you said it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's safe for work and safe for lunch. Yeah. So. <laughs> so, hey, hey, Ron, welcome to the show. Yeah. Do you want to introduce Thank yourself, you. Ron? Sure. I am the ringleader of the hybrid group. We're a software development company based in Los Angeles, California, home of the flying space robots. If you're a fan of either the Jet Propulsion Laboratory or SpaceX, you know, I'm not making this up. So, uh, Service announcement, yes, we are a software development consultancy, so if you want great software development, give us a try, hybridgroup.com. All right, service announcement wait, out of the way. Wait, you're with spa- You're with SpaceX? Uh, no, we're, they're just sort of neighbors. Oh, okay, okay. Because I was going to say, are you teaching children to program so that you can launch them into space because they're little? <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be somewhat ideal. That's brilliant. How come NASA never thought of that? I mean, just shuttle could be yeah. significantly smaller. You know, they yeah. did. It's yeah. called Space Camp. That's true. Yeah, That's I'm going to derail us back to uh, the topic at hand. <laughs> um, so <laughs> this episode is actually part of uh, a podcast. Wait, we have a topic. Yeah, it's uh, we're teaching kids to program, and it's part of this podcast carnival that was organized by Zach Kesson from the Mostly Airlink podcast. And okay. so, and uh, there are six other shows that are also doing the same thing. They're talking about it this week. So if you subscribe to them or just go pick up the episode, you can uh, see that. They're all listed at podcastcarnival.com. And really quickly, it's mostly Erlang, us, uh, giant robots smashing into other giant robots, the changelog, herding code, and node up. So if you want to go check out any of those shows, and we'll put links in the show notes as well, as to the carnival. Um, so you can go check that out and get like six podcasts where we're all talking about it's amazing what program. I can learn by listening to my own podcast. <laughs> I get that a lot. <laughs> oh, I, I um, do that sometimes where I hear myself say something and I'm like, I don't think I knew that. I, I didn't know everything you just said and I'm super excited about it. <laughs> I was like, when did I know that? <laughs> Apparently when we recorded. When you, yeah, that's very similar when you Google uh, some trouble you're running into with programming and you find that's... your own blog post right. from last year. Yep. That's the yeah. first result. That's when you know you are genuinely screwed. Yeah. <laughs> that's when the internet became surreal for me. Yes. <laughs> if I can't yes. help me, nobody can. <laughs> yep. All right, well, let's talk about kids. Yeah. So, Ron, you've been doing stuff with teaching kids to program for a while. 
Yes, I, yeah, I actually that's... invented uh, teaching kids and <laughs> <laughs> programming. <laughs> yeah, and the I know that's... And stuff yeah, like exactly. that. Yeah, exactly. I know that that's I I uh, I get that strangely. We all learn from somebody. So obviously there was someone teaching kids programming, or at least humans programming, or else we wouldn't be programming now. QED. But yeah, I um I think that infinite recursion runs out of steam at, at like Alan Turing or something like that. Or Alan K, perhaps, but yes. <laughs> so I actually have been involved in education in different forms, you know, informally, not as a professional pedagogue, which I'll get into hopefully a little while later in our conversation. But what started the recent serious labors of love that we have done um, at Harvard Group with a little project called Kids Ruby that a few people have heard of, I was actually inspired uh, just as far as Kids Ruby. So Kids Ruby is a, an easy way for kids to learn to program in what is probably the most beautiful programming language, Ruby. What inspired it was I saw a giant need as far as making it easy for kids to get started. You know, you say, oh, I want to teach my kid to program. So I give them a brand new shiny MacBook Pro and First thing that I say is, hey, kid, you got to download Xcode. And they're like, huh? Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> you know, that's a lot different from <laughs> the machines that many of us, and certainly my generation, you know, we learned from things like the Commodore 64, the Apple II. You just turned it on, and there was your basic prompt. You were immediately yeah. coding. You couldn't do anything without coding, and even arguably the same with DOS, you know, certainly the same with Bash or many other shells. You know, you're immediately in a kind of programming environment as opposed to what is both the good and the bad side of, you know, the legacy of uh, Doug Engelbart's work. You know, everything is a menu now and you can find everything, but it also made it for possible for us to be sort of caveman-esque in our use of technology where we just sort of point and groan and it does its thing, which is fine if we're going to be consumers of information, but if we are going to be producers of it, we have to have a different way of thinking. So looking around at the other things that were out there, and certainly there was nothing outside of Hackity Hack, which, fantastic project, by the way. Originally, I was driving to the Los Angeles Ruby meetup a couple of years ago, and I got stuck in very, very bad Los Angeles traffic. Legendary LA traffic. It actually took an hour longer to get to my destination. So I was left alone for an entire hour in my car to think alone. It's very dangerous. About think. traffic. Well, my mind drifted out of traffic, okay. you know, okay. away from the pain towards a different sort of pain. Um, mm -hmm. the previous year before that at uh, the Los Angeles Ruby conference, uh, which is coming up again this year, LARubyConf.com. It's a great conference. So one of the speakers at this particular conference was uh, Sarah Allen, and Sarah May was also there. Uh, if you're not familiar with these two programmers, they are the original founders of RailsBridge. Uh, Sarah Allen is an advisor to the president, and Sarah May has been a keynote speaker. And the two of them have been very involved in not only the outreach to teach more women programming, but they've also done some work involved with teaching kids programming. Sarah Allen actually went off to be like a, a fellow at the Smithsonian, right? So like her role in the administration is all about education, wow. which, is, which is pretty awesome. So uh, please continue. So we had a dinner after the conference and because uh, many of us were very enthused about teaching, you know, kids programming or doing something, somehow getting involved. And, you know, we vowed to start thinking about getting ready to make a plan. So a whole year had passed approximately when I'm sitting there in my car on traffic and I'm thinking, you know, over the last year I, I have done for a year. nothing over this last year since we had this great dinner and conversation and I was all enthused. I myself had not done anything at all. You know, time passed, got busy, whatever excuses I had created for myself in this long, boring hour of LA traffic of introspection. I, uh, Decided to change the topic of the talk I was about to go give at the LA Ruby meetup. Gave a spontaneous talk when I got there about why we need to teach kids programming and gave it a name, Kids Ruby, 
which was at the time really nothing more than, you know, we're going to go in and we're going to, at the time, Y had disappeared and his projects were kind of languishing and, you know, we're old and crufty anyway, even at the time. I mean, Y's code was always inspirational, not really production grade, as he himself, you know, had said. This is an idea of a thing you should do, not necessarily what you should actually do. So but I, it started out, oh, we're going to just fork hackity hack and we're going to, you know, fix it and add a bunch of stuff to it and translate it into a, we're going to, you know, turn it into a much better thing. Then I stared at Wise Code for a couple of days and I realized I uh, couldn't actually work on that code while in the state of mind necessary to understand all that code, perhaps, or, you know, it just, it, it wasn't the way I thought about writing code. So, so it sounds like uh, like wise code is a transcendental experience. Oh, it, uh, awesome. it, it is self-referential, <laughs> uh, certainly. So after staring at this code for a while, I realized, let's go back to first principles. What are we trying to do? It's really a kind of a simple idea and drawing on a lot of the same conceptual influences as, you know, Brett Victor uh, does uh, with Light Table you know, which actually came out around the same time. So I can't say, you know, one was influenced by the other at all. It was more that we were influenced by the same underlying ideas, which was a better way to look at code, you know, a simpler way to look at code, which was the code is on the left, the results are on the right. You enter in the code, you click on the run button, you see what happens. That's it. There is no three. Three is what you make of it. Three is what you do. Three is the space into which you insert your own ideas and that was all it is it was a you know very deceptively simple idea like playing the conga so drum it looks really easy until you actually try to do it then you realize there's infinite depth to it right so a few of us at hybrid group got excited about this idea and you know every day is a hackathon at hybrid group so we we got started along with a couple of our other friends in the community and then got our first version of Kids Ruby ready to do our first Kids Ruby class at the, again, LA Ruby Conf. I think it was 2011. And uh, it was very, very challenging. It didn't work on anything but Ubuntu USB drive that we had created. So we had to boot everybody into that. We, you know, we didn't have, it didn't work on Windows. It didn't work on the Mac. It turns out, it's a lot harder to install a new Ruby without installing Xcode and a bunch of compilation tools. I mean, there's a significant bar to entry yes. that, you know, Yehuda Katz um, did some work on and a number of other people. Uh, Yehuda actually helped with Kids Ruby later, as did many people in the Ruby community, where I drafted them basically like, hey, I've got this problem. Sit down and pair with me right now because i got a class in two days. And it's RubyConf, and I know you don't give a talk for three hours. <laughs> that was that was uh, a couple of years later. Yeah, I had I got to pair with Yehuda, you know, with Aaron Patterson, with Jim Weirich, with a bunch of people. I, I can't even remember everyone. If I've missed your name, I'm sorry. It was the greatest RubyConf of my life. I missed every session. All I did was pair with various people to <laughs> deal with various issues I had with compilation of, you know, serial port jam on you know, Windows or OS X yeah. or who knows what. Basically, everything in time for our kids' class that we were teaching on the Sunday afterwards. But it was the greatest ex- Ruby Conf of my life. Getting to pair with all these geniuses, it was, you know, immensely satisfying and humbling experience, as all of this has been. <laughs> so it's time for Hallway Conf. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm-hmm. A hallway track is always the best. Just so I want to talk talks. about a lot of things you've touched on there. Yeah, so I, I want to say, too, that I have a, um, a nephew who's in high school and, an, and an, a niece who's uh, soon to be in high school. And, you know, they're both really interested in learning to program. And so I, I'm here to represent, you know, teenage kids and find out about that because I want, I want to be guiding them in that direction. Lucky you're not their parents or else they wouldn't <laughs> listen to you at all. <laughs> I, was, I was actually going to say, those sound like teenagers. I, I guess when you're uh, as old as Josh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The definition of Thank kid you. changes. Yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, I, you know, I, I look at people in their 20s and they're all kids to me now. So. <laughs> We're all kids here. But there actually, that was, that was perhaps one failing of naming it Kids Ruby was teenagers are like, We're not kids. <laughs> oh, should we call it Teen Ruby? No, that's not cool. Yeah, because then it would know everything. It, no, it needs vampires that sparkle. <laughs> Emo Ruby. 
Emo Ruby. Emo <laughs> Ruby. <laughs> Ron made a, a lot of good points there, I think, and there's like a ton of things I would like to say, but I'll start with just this one. While computers have definitely, you know, moved to the point where like, yeah, I can't even imagine thinking about installing Ruby on a new Mac as part of a ramp up, you know. Although, hey, Maverick ships with a modern Ruby, which is kind of cool. But also, I think in some ways things have gotten easier. For example, I got my little girl for Christmas uh, the game Robot Turtles. And if you haven't seen this, it was a Kickstarter project, but it's kind of beyond that now. And it's a board game, and you set up these little scenarios with, like, you know, this robot uh, turtle. <laughs> get get it, robot turtle. And uh, a gem that the robot's trying to get to. And there's these walls, and, and there's ice and lasers. And it, it's, a, it's a very simple game, so much that, you know, the basic concepts start basically with move forward, turn left, turn right, and that's about it, you know. And uh, that's good, because uh, my little girl's just three and a half, and that's right about her speed so far. And then as they get older, they ramp up, and you you add more and more of these concepts to kind of get them into it. And the idea is that you're starting to teach some basic programming-like concepts, you know, series of uh, steps that leads to some outcome, you know, uh, th- there, it even has kind of functions that come in, uh, sort of later in the cycle. But I think it's interesting to remember that, you know, not all teaching of programming has to happen at a keyboard or things like that. And we have some good resources for kind of starting to get those ideas and, or help people think that way before we ever get there. Like Robot Turtles, there's also the Goldie Blocks books, which are uh, more engineering focused, but they uh, have kids read this book and construct little, you know, incredible machine-like contraptions and stuff. Robot Turtles is pretty great. It is a board game. And again, you know, and again, it's nothing original, nothing new there at all. It's tremendously well put together, but there have been actually some great physical games using kids as elements of a processor where you know kids are themselves data elements and like one kid's the cpu and other kids are memory and you know there's been a bunch of great games created that are out there you know have been for a number of years you know i love robot turtles because it you know puts together a bunch of those concepts and it you know makes it a nice label and a nice package and in our modern era, if we don't have a nice label and packaging, it's very hard for people to rally around them. You know, I think that's a big part of the reason why we're seeing that with uh, Kickstarter. But, you know, to its credit, Robots Turtles is a physical product to teach the concepts of computing at a young age. I saw another really cool project just recently from Linda Lucas of uh, Rails Girls fame, Hello Ruby, which is actually a book, a new Kickstarter that just came out. Check that out. It looks uh, very cool as well. You know, and again, I think it's a very legitimate use of Kickstarter in this case of saying, hey, there are going to be physical production costs to actually create this physical product. I'm not just as saying, if you don't fund this, I'm not going to work on this open source thing, you know, which is certainly the danger of Kickstarter. Perhaps that's a good time to meander over to the topic of, should we really be trying to use the teaching of the next generation as a way to make money? Should that be a profit or is that the shared infrastructure of the 21st century? Is that something that's a commons, that's a collective that really none of us own? But if that's the case, how do we actually invest into it sufficiently to really give it the attention it needs? Yeah, that's what it comes down to for me. I think things like the Kickstarter projects and even if, you know, you have classes that parents have to sign up for and and stuff like that to bring their kids or whatever, I don't view it as a, so much as a, um, charging for providing the service or anything like that. It's that, it's that these things take lots of energy and effort. You know, it's like you talked about how much energy you put into getting kids Ruby functional and stuff, you know, and, and people, it's like, well, I can do that or I can work on these other things. And it, I encourages people to work on that and make it better. And I think that's a good thing overall. Well, that brings up a couple of great points that I think would be great for us to talk about. One of them is this idea of the intrinsic value of programming. Like, wow, we should teach everyone to program. Well, why? 
I mean, why should we teach everyone <laughs> to program? So, right. I mean, more mm -hmm. specifically, well, actually, Seymour Papert wrote really articulately on this as a guy who's been leonized by all of the different, those who've come after, certainly. And uh, Brett Victor blogged about this, I think, a couple of months ago. You know, should we really teach programming to everyone? Papert was kind of astounded at the conclusion that people took that somehow learning to program improved your brain intrinsically. Papert did not have that idea at all. Papert's concept was more programming is a transport mechanism for ideas. It is not a thing in and of itself to teach. You know, it's not like going to the gym and if I do lifts that my muscles get bigger. It's that if I have to learn how to dance in order to perform a dance routine, that, that but the value of it is not the practice of it per se. It's the end result. So a lot of what has been this popularization of the let's learn to code movement, which, you know, I, I certainly respect and appreciate. I mean, thank you very much, code.org, for sending so much traffic to kids, Ruby, for example, and, uh, you know, doing things like the hour of code, you know, I, I think are very good in the sense of, okay, we've raised visibility, but we have to also visibility to what? There's a lot of different reasons why one perhaps might wish to learn to code. And a quote from the great B.B. King, the blues musician, you know, he said there was only three reasons to learn to play music. And I, I've always tried to apply this to coding. You know, it's either to have some fun, make some money, or to learn something. And if you were doing it for any other reason, you know, you should put your guitar down, or in this case, the keyboard. <laughs> Yeah. Now, like I said, I got a, I got a nephew. He's you know like sixteen now, and I he's wondering what he's going to do with his life. Right? He's at that age, and I I said learn to learn to program because when you're an adult, you know, like in ten or twenty years, pretty much every professional job is going to include some sort of software literacy in the job requirements. You know, doing doing you know business metrics reporting. You know, the people who can who can program are going to have a an advantage over the people who can't because right? they can build their own reports, learn exactly what they need to learn. Yes, yes, exactly that. And so that's my problem with charging people for this is we're really charging them for access to oxygen. <laughs> nice. It you could, know. Be, could be worse. We could be charging them for Wi-Fi, right? Right. <laughs> oh. And, and, uh, yeah, exactly. Well... That is, in fact, an, an issue. It is an issue. No. Some some places have actually declared it to be like a right of the citizens and stuff like that. Yeah, um, whereas others, you know, they've shut down the library hours, and the public library was one of the few places where people uh, who were not of means, like, are we all, we're spoiled brats in the technology in industry. We are. You know, talk about first world problems, and just the fact that that yeah. meme even exists just pretty much spells it out, you know, we're so far above Maslow's pyramid that we're looking down at it going, oh, great view from up here. Let me get a picture <laughs> from my smartphone. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and it's easy to forget this. We do a um, infrequent free all day programming camps for kids called Kids Code Camp. And uh, we're actually going to be doing the next one coming up at the Scale Conference, which is the Southern California Linux Expo in its 12th year. There's actually going to be two days of tracks that are oriented around, you know, kids and young coders and, and uh, new people. But uh, what was the point of this? Oh, yeah, scale, kids code camp. Right. So we did one in Baltimore at uh, RailsConf, and a whole busload of kids was brought in from Baltimore's Digital Harbor High School. So Digital Harbor High School is a public high school in Baltimore which is accessible to any kid in the city via a lottery. So there's no other prerequisite for entering. It's strictly based on available spots and a lottery. So grades are not taken into account. Nothing else is taken into account. It's the one and only school of its kind in Baltimore. It's like the wire with white MacBooks given out to each kid. Huh. And I'm not exaggerating <laughs> Working with these kids for one day was was deeply humbling. I have, I have goosebumps right now, actually. You know, the, these are kids who come from, you know, deeply impoverished socioeconomic backgrounds. You know, they're kids of families of which 
frequently one or more family members have been incarcerated or are incarcerated. They came to this class starving for knowledge. We had a, a box of books that was kindly donated by O'Reilly. Every single one of these books was gone. And these kids, they weren't grabbing gratuitously. Their questions were hyper-focused. They were, how do I build an app and get it on the app store so I can charge for it? Yep. How can I build a website that's got an e-commerce shopping cart? Because their cousins and their siblings are out standing on the street corner washing a car window trying to pick up a few spare dollars. Mm -hmm. You know, this is their same entrepreneurial spirit, not in the sense of I want to gratify myself with creating the next dog walking app, but how am I going to survive mm -hmm. in the most literal sense? Right. So seeing this, it was an enormous reality check for anybody who was forgetting that, you know, we are intensely fortunate to work in the industry we do and with the tools that we do and live the lifestyles that we do. So, you know, we should be giving back. We should be making the time. Public service is the price that we should be paying for the intense level of good fortune. I don't want to use the word privilege because I don't mean it in the social justice context, but I mean how greatly fortunate that we are to be lucky enough to have the advantages that we do and the obligation that we have to then give back because it's not like, oh, it'd be nice. But really, how did we get here? You know, in my case, it was a public education system. Mm -hmm. And, you know, on that for a minute, just to riff, you know, I, I think that there are many different ways to educate kids. You know, I understand people's sentiments behind homeschooling or private schools or charter schools. And I think that that's great for your own kids if you choose to do that. Absolutely. But I think that the rest of the community is missing out significantly just by the presence of your children in this group and that, you know, where we start to resemble the group that we're around, well, we need to take a true leadership position by actually walking the talk and not just saying, oh, I think we'd like to do that. And to go back to Baltimore for a minute, my friend Dave Troy, let's give a shout out to, you know, if you don't know Dave. I actually do. <laughs> Dave's a great guy. <laughs> yeah, he's awesome. He's quite brilliant. And also he uh, moved from the suburbs back into metropolitan Baltimore in order to really walk the talk of his beliefs that we need to be good citizens by actually engaging directly with the communities in which we live, not just saying we're going to, or, you know, I know it's real easy to throw a few bucks at somebody via Kickstarter and feel like you've done something, but that's not enough, especially the kind of money that we all make as software developers. You know, that's the easy way out. And, to just say, oh, somebody else is going to take care of this problem so I can, you know, go feel good about myself. Well, I'm glad that, you know, it's a contribution. Yeah. But we can really go a lot further until you, you know, people have given us, you know, some contributions for Kids Ruby. And, you know, we've spent a lot more than we've taken in just because when we hold these kids code camps, you know, we're giving them free lunch. We're giving them USB drives with open source software. You know, we're donating our time. We're providing a location. We're giving them free T-shirts. We're basically paying these kids to come. To a programming camp. Awesome. So, where, where do I sign up? <laughs> so I so, want to ask a question about organizing something like this. You know, how do you find a venue and the the resources to do this if you're not, you know, uh, I'm assuming hybrid group makes enough to, you know, kind of pay for all of that. But I'm personally not in a position to do that. So how would I go about organizing an event like this? You know, the Kids Code Camp concept, which is sort of like a programming circus coming to town. You know, <laughs> I love it. You know, it's a one day thing. We've co located it with geek conferences. So it's been relatively easy to just dovetail it off of the organizers. Like, hey, let's do a free programming thing for kids. Like, if you say no to that, there will be a mob of angry humans at your door just saying, oh, you know, please reconsider, <laughs> quit. Uh, or if that's how they put it, I doubt. But uh, not everyone says yes. And then there's, you know, lots of companies that are eager to throw into the kitty of handling some expenses. So it's really a matter of organizing them. But, you know, that's just one thing. You know, there are many, you know, we come to town if we're doing it at, you know, a RailsConf or a scale or whatever. And 
get a bunch of kids excited. We, you know, we do community outreach so that we get kids there who are not just kids of the programmers, you know, cause they're, those are great kids too. I, uh, you know, but we really want to get out beyond our own little community, mm-hmm. you know, reaching out to other more marginalized communities or which might not be one based on race or socioeconomic class. It's just being a geek is still not cool. <laughs> Certainly not in yeah. the USA. Speak for yourself. <laughs> so well, I think it's yeah. cool. We think it's cool, but you know, uh, people say, yeah, I know what geeks are like. I've seen the big bang theory. I'm like, that's you people are making fun of us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that, you know, that, that does not portray us in the light that we see ourselves. <laughs> I think it's perfectly accurate. Bazinga. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So dovetailing off of a conference, I guess that makes sense as far as like, uh, you know, yeah, let me just uh, finish that thought before we go off. So kids code camp is cool. That's great. But, it's just a one day thing. So what then? You know, the circus rides off into the sunset and the kids are like, great. You know, it's a bridge to Terabithia scenario. You left me here and now what do I do? You know, and that is where other groups have, have risen up from this same movement of which we are just a part. You know, going back to the idea, you know, we didn't invent kids or programming or teaching kids to program. And, uh, there's some great organizations. You know, Coder Dojo being a particular favorite of mine for a couple of reasons. You know, Coder Dojo took the same concept of what we have tried to do with Kids Code Camp, but made it a lot more structured. You know, we we had this idea, oh, we want a cookbook so that, you know, someone who wants to do this has, you know, the recipes for actually organizing it. Well, Coder Dojo took it further and, great, we're going to actually set up a place for the regular weekly series of events, you know, more like the computer clubs of yore, you know, whereas Kids Code Camp was about, let's, you know, get you excited about the idea, Coder Dojo then fills in that gap of, okay, now what are we all going to do about it on a regular basis? So, you know, I very much look to them as far as, you know, and, and in terms of the mass marketing of programming as a thing, you know, Code.org has done a lot better job just, you know, again, they, our focus was let's build some tools and actually go out and do it at a very grassroots level. They said, let's recognize the way that mass media works on the Internet and do a cool video to, you know, raise awareness and raise a bunch of money, you know, which worked really, really well. And these are very complementary strategies. You know, those of us who are doing the projects that are then feeding into these movements, we're not trying to start a movement. We're, it's, that's just... You know, I don't think anybody goes to try to start a movement. If they do, they probably fail. We're just riding off of those same waves. So in terms of what the resources are to do it yourself, there's a lot of them now. You know, and I've mentioned just a couple of them. And that doesn't even include great things like, you know, I'll give a shout out to uh, the Pasadena Foundation run by my friend Eric Dreher. So Pasadena, California, home of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, they have an amazing nonprofit organization called the Pasadena Foundation. And the Pasadena Foundation actually raised money and created curriculum to be used in the public schools to teach programming and robotics. So like third period robotics class starting in middle school. That's amazing. I want to go back. No kidding. Right? Seriously. Yeah. And it works really well for a couple of reasons. One of them is that it's just a regular part of school. It takes away the whole self-selection bias that takes place with those who are courageous enough to identify as geek, which is not cool at best and can actually get you, you know, physical sanctions at worst. You know, can we just, can we just call it bullying? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, there's a lot of st- bullying goes on for any reason. At all. You know, and anything that can identify a marginalized minority is going to be used as a pretext for bullying. It happens. And especially when that person has something you don't, then envy creates a particularly vicious kind of bullying. And that's a different problem. But it, we can't talk about teaching kids without thinking about that as a part of the context of what they're dealing with. You know, it's, it's easy for, you know, the kids in Palo Alto, 
you know, who all have multiple computers and it's all really cool and they all go to a, you know, school where like all the cool kids are going to college and then you go to East Palo Alto and things are a lot different. They're a lot different. Like if you have a nice computer, someone's going to beat you up and take it away from you and there's nothing you can do about it. And if you try to go to the authorities, then there's going to be even worse bullying. So, you know, this is the reality that you're looking at and this is the environment we have to work within to try to do something about it. You know, it's easy to throw our hands up and say, oh, the future is in trouble. We can't do anything. I give up. But that's not really true. I mean, we're going to have to live in that future. And even more, you know, those of us who have kids, we literally have skin in the game. Yeah. And, it, yeah, and it doesn't matter if it's your bio kids or their adopted kids or they're just kids you care about. They're your kids in the sense that you've taken some responsibility for the outcome of their lives and, you know, actively doing something about it. So, you know, kudos to all these volunteers. And and there have been a group of people for many years who have dedicated their lives to studying how to better teach kids and have devoted their lives to low-paying careers and sometimes dangerous environments in order to make that happen. They're called teachers. Yeah. <laughs> so For sure. why is it that we geeks with our frankly massive egos who like to think that we know everything, thinking that we can do anything better under the sun, in particular, like something intellectual like teaching? Oh, well, clearly we're going to be better. I mean, we're smarter than everyone. So, of course, we're going to be better at teaching, right? You know, kind of ignoring the fact that, I mean, if you're such a good cook, you should be in the kitchen as the chef. And I should be at the table, you know, waiting for the food to come out. Oh, yeah, right. People, you know, kind of forget that. So professional teachers have been struggling with less resources, more students per class, more of an emphasis on test taking and test preparation, less flexibility in curriculum. You know, there have been a lot of factors and just a general hostility on the part of the people who would be the most likely to be able to help them. You know, and then when the affluent take their kids out of the public system and put them into private schools or homeschooling, then the system becomes even more impoverished. And we need to put resources into gifted education, too. So, so well, it needs to be part of the public system and not just, yeah. you know, our own discretionary, you know, we all have a role to play. Industry, we have our role to play. The public sector has its role to play. And just the general public also has its role to play. And if all of these groups don't get together on the same side, then you end up with sort of the scenario we have now. Yeah. And there's not agreement. You know, everybody doesn't agree on what the right approaches are and where to put funding and all that. So, yeah, those are big structural problems that need, need to get fixed. I like that you are out there putting it out there and doing what you can as an individual and, you know, within your community. Yeah. So that's, that's awesome. That's inspiring. I want to know more about how, you know, like this conversation, I want it to be about like, how do we all do that? How do we get out there and be individually involved in energizing our communities? I want to add to that just a little bit. I read this great piece a year back or more called Stop Stealing Dreams by Seth Godin, I think. And it's it's a really critical piece about like what's wrong with the schools and, and where are they going wrong. And, and it's the kind of thing that you read through and it's very detailed and you expect to get to the end and, and, and see something like, we got a new kid and start over or, or the homeschool everybody or whatever, you know, um, you would expect that kind of ending from it. Uh, but what really made me respect it was like how he ends on, you know, yeah, public schools got some problems and we got to figure out how to fix these problems or whatever, but we should be, you know, putting into the public system. You should be, you know, sending your kids. You should be taking them and their three friends from school to the museum or whatever to basically the, the little things we can all do to help raise the overall level of everything, you know, and bring others with us. You know, I, I think that's. Well, really- James, thank you. Uh, you just hit two critical topics to me right there. And it was also kind of a partly response to Josh's as well. Everybody wants to do some big thing that gets all, you know, PR coverage on the usual websites. Why? 
Why do that? Why not just do something that's a little more humble? It's sort of like I'm willing to donate money to people I don't know, but not give help to people I do. <laughs> right. You know, because it's embarrassing. <laughs> right. It's embarrassing for who? You know, <laughs> it's really embarrassing to need help and not get any. You know, start at the at your local level. If you have kids, start with your kids and their friends. If you don't have kids, go find kids. There's kids everywhere. Just listen. Out. Uh, just open the window. Stick your head out. Listen. I bet you there's a school not too far from you unless you live in an intensely rural area. Go down to that school. Say hello. I'd like to help. They'll be like, you know, once they're like, oh, my God, a unicorn just walked in. Like, it's a local community volunteer here to help who's not trying to sell me something. What? Like, you know, once, once they stop crying, they'll be like, wow, where do you want to help? Because, you know, you could just kind of pick a spot. You know, every school's website sucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, right. So, so, so there's that, but there's also like, you know, we're breeding a bunch of new, like, uh, startup millionaires out here in California. And so there's like a ton of like technically literate programmers who are driven to achieve, who have, you know, through their perseverance or good fortune, uh, ended up with, uh, a lot of free time and income and, you know, there are you know, a lot of them don't have to work anymore. And I would love to see a lot of those people just like go to schools and start teaching how to program. Yeah. yeah so I'd like to see them do it at the grassroots level, yeah. not just like I want to start yet another code.org. Right. Because it sort of right. satisfies my ego as a founder to have my name attached to another thing. I mean, the most authentic kind of giving is the anonymous kind. You know, that which we could have gone the route. We had investors saying, we want to fund Kids Ruby. And we just sort of looked at them like, um, well, that's really nice of you. But, you know, why don't you just go make a donation to your local public school? And they can invite us to come for free because, you know, we're just doing this. And the only re way that this can happen is if everybody does a little. If ever, if, you know, we outsource it to a particular set of organizations, no matter how well intended, you know, then we really lose the social anarchy, which created open source in the first place. And that is really the thing we're trying to teach is this idea of the maintaining the commons, you know, going around and picking up the trash at the park. Why? Because there was, a, I saw trash at the park. We're not waiting for the city to go and clean it all up and complain the whole time. Like what a bad job they do. But also going back to something that uh, James said, you know, about taking them to the museum. I would like to fight against this idea that we need to teach STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math. And I'd like to introduce, we need to teach STEAM, you know, the arts and the humanities are even more important. They're actually way more important. Actually, I'm going to, I'm just going to stand out. The humanities are more important than engineering. Here is why. Because if we do not know the reasons for which we do things, then either we do the wrong things or there are unintended consequences of our actions that we fail to consider. And, you know, I like to pick on... Um, Ron, that's awesome. I, I think there's a third point, which is if we don't understand the reasons that we do things, what, then if the things those reasons are based on change, then we don't change what we're doing. Like if you're eating because you're hungry and you don't understand that you're eating because you're hungry and you stop being hungry, you keep eating. Right. Hey, not good for you. Yeah, yeah. And also so, but, not knowing the difference between healthy food and unhealthy food mm -hmm. and just trying to satisfy a craving to put something into your stomach versus, you know, some understanding about what kinds of foods you should eat, you know, the quantities of foods you should eat and such. You know, there's a there's a lot to it. And so, you know, part of it is the need for design and technology, which is the utility part of aesthetic. You know, it's not just aesthetics for their own sake, but why are we anti-aesthetics for their own sake? You know, looking at the humanities as something that is only for the affluent, you know, it does a great disservice to the arts. It also does a great disservice to the rest of humanity. Oscar Wilde, all of us are in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. Well, the stars are up there for all of us. We just have to know to look. And if we do not teach that to the younger generations,
and then we decry them for their lack of taste, it's because we never taught them any. I we think, never exposed them. I think you've really got something there, too. And, and to kind of tie it back in with the little things you can do, I think the problem we have with some of this is trying to bite off more than we can chew and underestimating how far the little things can go. So, like, for example, a buddy of mine and I, uh, we get together once in a while. We've been working on our 3D printer, you know, and just putting it together, you know, in, in you know, on the kitchen table, you know, having some fun. And we're about 90% of the way there now. We've got the whole thing going. You can watch the motors move and stuff. We've got a couple minor things to fix, and we're going to be printing 3D objects. And you should see how our young children react to this. You know, they come in, they talk about the printer, they watch it move, they want to know how we're doing and progress like that. Along similar lines, we did a thing a few weekends back like, hey, let's get together and build a game in one day using Ruby Gosu, you know, so we can figure out what this Gosu thing is. And we did. We got together and in a day we had a game, you know, a functional game. And um, our kids were playing with it that night, you know, and it's the like they see this happening and they know that people are able to do these things, you know, and then obviously our, our kids are very young. So uh, we do let them help out, you know, in areas where they can and stuff. But as they get older and they want to help more, you know, sure, you bet, let's do it. And I think just this seeing that these kinds of things are possible, you know, and experiencing that changes the way you think about things, right? Then you you have access to more possibilities. You believe in more things than the kids that don't see that kind of stuff. James, I wonder if there's actually like a growing place in family life for the children to get involved in like household programming activities. Oh, you mean like uh, messing around with the uh, home automation and stuff yeah. like that? <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, when I was a kid, you know, I was like five years old and my mom started teaching me to cook. And, you know, I've been cooking my whole life and it's an incredibly valuable life skill. You know, I learned a lot of stuff from my parents from that, you know, like all sorts of stuff. You know, I, I know how to clean and cook and, you know, keep up the house and, you know, install baseboards and, you know, all that, all that stuff. And as programming becomes more and more of, you know, you know pre present in our lives, it's like, we're going to be programming our houses. You know, like when I was a kid, I had to program the VCR, right? Because my right. Started, yeah. right? <laughs> you know, off to a good start, right? That it is there well, that's other... a great, that's a great point. Um, yeah. You know, and, and the maker movement and the mini maker movement, you know, it's not just about programming, but it's also about making a physical things, you know, uh, we have focused on electronics a lot, but it's also, you know, knitting or, or sculpture. You know, it's the making of things, the creation act itself. Uh, but I worry a little bit about the closed nature of some of the more popular companies, you know, Apple in particular, you know, Apple is the new Microsoft in this way where there's less user serviceable anything or user accessible anything. Yeah where things are actually locked away and you can't even do it. You're not even allowed to. In fact, you may be violating some law by doing so inadvertently. So compared to, to say a ThinkPad where you buy it, it comes and it comes with the manual that explains how to take the whole dang thing apart. Right. Right. And if you go back to another hacker generation, one before ours, the car hackers, right? The hot rodders, as they were known to each other and to us, right? They were dealing with supposed closed source, but it was all actually open. All the bolts fit, you know, engine blocks could be put onto different transmissions and switched around. There was a large body of knowledge, both official in the terms of manuals as well as unofficial, you know, in terms of tribal knowledge that was shared, groups of enthusiasts. There was a whole movement of experimenters, and that same kind of thinking is what created the tech industry as we know it, you know, this ability to tinker. And a lot of the products that are being sold, except outside of a very few that are in the open hardware movement, figuring out how to lock them down is, you know, first and foremost on the list of the investors' priorities. So I'm not sure how 
you know, that's very antithetical to teaching a hacker generation. Like there was an article in Forbes that was sort of emblematic of exactly this problem. The title of which was something like, uh, this, I think it was from November, or October of time frame. It was, how do we teach kids to program without teaching them to be hackers? And, you know, the vein in my forehead was bulging. I was literally foaming at the mouth. I'm like, we want to teach them to be hackers, you fools. Yes, you know, exactly. That is exactly the point. In fact, I can't wait to teach these kids to be hackers just so that they can subvert your dominant paradigm and perhaps <laughs> come up with a new one. Exactly. Because if we actually want... If we want to progress as a society, we're going to need some new ideas and some new thinking, but it has to be built up off of the old ones. If we don't even know what they are, then we just keep reinventing, you know, Unix, but not as well, you know, as to well, paraphrase. Does, does, does Forbes understand that hacker means tinkerer, or are they using the common perception of, uh, you know, hacker means, you know, what we refer to as, as crackers or, you know, people that, uh, are, are, yeah, black hats, basically. I'm okay with people being a little af afraid of black hats, and it sounds like you're okay with having some kids be out there be a little black hat so they can subvert the paradigm and that sort of thing. But well, no, let, let, me, let me rephrase uh, that. Okay, just okay. Clear. Kids do not be crackers, do not violate laws, <laughs> do not go to jail, do not take your parents with you to jail. This episode of Ruby Rogues is provided entirely for educational purposes only. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I, I will not bake you a cake with a file in it and send it to you. I'm some sorry. Of the, <laughs> some, some of the people who laughed at that joke have been on Alt 2600 back when the uh, Usenet was around. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and the, that's the thing is the war on hackers, it's posited, is the new war on drugs. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a place for the large uh, resources of law enforcement to be allocated and a new villain, a new scary person. And so we're the heroes yeah. and the villains, right? And, you know, on the one hand, we, you know, the Zuckerberg characters are thrown out, which, hey kids, grow up and be a Zuckerberg, which, you know, that is not how I want my kids to end up. And, you know, <laughs> nothing, against, nothing against, nothing against him as a person. I know very little about him. I've never met him, so I can't really weigh in on that. But the thing that this representation of do whatever it takes to fight your way through competition in order to make a lot of money, I think that's teaching really the wrong lessons about why we should do these things, and that's not building the kind of society that I would like to see. You know, one where, you know, making of money, it goes back to that Kickstarter idea. Why do we pay so much attention to projects that are funded on Kickstarter? Well, it's because people funded it on Kickstarter. The same reason we pay so much attention to companies that receive venture financing. You know, some of these said this was worth a bunch of money, basically. And that's a kind of social reinforcement. Perhaps there are other kinds of social reinforcement that we could also use that might encourage other characteristics that are the ones that we want to see. Not, I want to just make a bunch of money, but perhaps I want to contribute to open source or I want to do something that makes the world significantly better and does not have an associated cost. Yeah. I want to jump in here real quick. We, we've talked a lot about the reasons why and, and some of the ways to, to get involved. What I'm really interested in is at my kids' school, they have after-school programs. And, you know, so I want to get in and I want to help my kids, but I want to help some of the other kids that are at the school. You know, it, it's pretty varied as far as, you know, income and background at the school. And so, um, you know, some of these kids really won't have the opportunity because, you know, their parents aren't involved in technology or they're not involved in you know, in ways that where they would really have an opportunity to explore the thinking processes and learning that goes on with programming. So if I wanted to go in and set up like a club, what what would I need? And what age levels are we looking at? Because my kids are in elementary school, so they're not, they're not at the, you know, 12 and older group. My oldest is eight. My youngest is two. And, you know, so, so when abouts are they at that age where they can start doing this? Well, there's a lot of great resources. The two that immediately pop to mind, I, I'd mentioned uh, Coder Dojo, you know, which is very community organized, basically sort of like setting up a computer club at your, at your child's school. The nice thing about that is it's very open ended. You can do whatever you want with it. They have different curriculums and different things that, but one that's a lot older and a lot better structured as far as specifics are uh, Lego First Robotics which if you're not familiar, 
you know, Lego has a huge educational division, and Lego First Robotics is a robotic competition uh, that starts out at the local, goes up to the regional, state, and then national levels that takes place every year. One of the speakers at RobotsConf in December of last year was uh, Wei Lao, who uh, is not a, an official representative of Lego First Robotics. He just happens to be a caring contributor participant who also happens to have led a couple of teams of high schoolers to win the national championship. So a couple of things about it that are good. One is, is that here in America, we care a lot more about sports than we do about pretty much anything else. And part of that is our love of competition. So adding a competitive element to it encourages some kids to get excited. And we all love competition. That's why we have hackathons. You know, that's why we have all these different kinds of events that are structured around, you know, winners and losers, whether or not that's the right message to be sending. It's a thing that exists right now. And a lot of kids who might not otherwise be interested are going to get interested and it's a factor of the professional world. It's a factor of the natural world. So there's no reason to run away from it. But Lego First Robotics is an excellent, I mean, they start at, you know, very young levels, you know, where it's not really competitive, where it's just playing with the different Lego Mindstorms or even just playing with Legos for that matter. There have been some really interesting things done with Kanban Legos. And I have kind of a little prototype design somewhere of doing a little teaching kids to program using Legos. And Ruby, actually. I just never kickstarted it. But Lego First Robotics actually gives out scholarships to kids to go to university to study robotics and computer science. Every year they have three to four million dollars of scholarships that are available that are not applied for. Yeah, I said that. I'll say it again. Every year there are three to four millions of dollars in scholarships that are available that are not granted because they do not have enough applicants. That's insane. Yep. Yeah, I know. So I would encourage it just for that alone, just to tap into all these resources that already exist. You know, between Coded Dojo and Lego First Robotics, if that, if you run out of steam there, you know, and again, elementary school, you know, we can start. Let's talk about things that are free and open source. You know, just in terms of software for a second. Scratch. Scratch is a visual programming environment. Some people call it block-based programming, where Instead of textual code, you're dragging a flowchart-like system to write your programs. It's a much easier way to teach very young programmers, especially those who lack the fine motor skills of typing. In fact, there's a version that has not come out yet, but it's called Scratch Junior. Scratch Junior is the same concept of Scratch, but even more simplified with some color choices that are easier for even younger kids to visualize. It's intended to teach programming as young as kindergarten age. So recent research into the brain development of babies has shown that very, very young children have far greater capacity to understand than they're actually able to express. Babies, before they're actually able to speak, are able to understand a lot more language. They just don't possess the necessary neurons to control, you know, a fairly complicated physiological process. Right. And, I, and this, this is why a lot of parents are, are using sign language to communicate with their young children. James, you did that with your, your girl, right? Yeah, we did. Actually, we started uh, pretty much when she was born and you can get lots of great books about it, just simple things to do with them. And uh, I think it was a pediatrician or something told us, you know, don't get discouraged. You probably won't see responses till about uh, seven months or something. Actually, our, our girl started signing at about five, doing, you know, just some simple symbols like milk and stuff that she picked up. And it was really cool, actually, uh, being able to communicate with them earlier on some level, you know. The one thing I've heard that makes me a little concerned about computer skills for, for young children is that I've heard that keyboarding, you know, typing on a keyboard doesn't create the same sort of hand-eye coordination that learning to write with a pencil or pen does. And that, you know, they've done a couple studies and I don't know who they is, but somebody's done a couple studies that shows that if children grow up typing all the time, it actually doesn't develop the parts of the brain that I I think the sooner they learn 
what carpal tunnel feels like, the better off they'll be. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think in response to that, I would say, I think we have this flaw where we think programming, computer, keyboard, uh, these are like horribly intertwined in our mind, but I don't know that it has to be quite that way. I mean, Ron brought up Lego Mindstorms, uh, you know, which is a very physical kind of programming. You know, obviously there's still some code playing with in different ways. That One of the things I, I mentioned, I've been working on a 3D printer. My ultimate goal is this. I'm building the 3D printer to be able to print parts to build uh, a little robot, like uh, on the ground, with just like three wheels probably, And uh, the idea there is I want to mount a pen in the center. And then I want to put like a logo programming environment to uh, talk to the robot so that they can drive the robot around and have it draw pictures, basically on like big pieces of paper, you know, and um, stuff like that. I I would say don't underestimate the value of the physical kinds of programming as well. Well, that's actually one reason why, as uh, many people know, I'm pretty deeply involved in robotics. In fact, you guys have to invite me back on to talk about that because that's like a whole other show. Agreed. Done. (laughs) But I will say on the subject, we introduced Kids Ruby Robot Edition about one year ago where we added support for the Sphero Robotic Sphere. So you could basically write some simple Ruby code to control the Sphero robot. And that was a revelation. The kids, their eyes were, uh, there was not a lot of blinking going on. Let me just put it that way. I mean, that's, there's only two reasons why kids actually want to learn to code. It's either to make games or to make robots. I guess there's a third reason, which is to get their parents off their back, but that's not a very good one. I was going to say to make robots that play games, but sure, that could work too. Um, it, it, in 10 years, kids are going to be building rogue robots and programming them to do their chores. Rogue robots, huh? <laughs> yeah. And then they are going to discover, just like the rest of us do, that the automation time takes way farther than doing the actual activity. And they'll do it anyway. It's not product. That's right. Maturity is the reward. We're trying to teach them how to do things. We we don't care about the actual results so much. It's the struggle of trying to get it to work. That's the fun part. You know, and that's what, that's what Papert was trying to say about programming. That programming is to teach ideas. It's not to teach the idea of programming as a thing of itself. It's as a carrier for concepts, learning, oh, I'm going to learn about the way that we can eliminate noise in a signal in order to, you know, reduce errors. Wow, that's a very interesting idea that we can actually get rid of errors. How do we get rid of errors? I thought once an error committed, once always shall it be. Well, no, actually. And uh, that goes to the fun concept, you know, of what James was saying. You know, you're building a 3D printer. I think that's great. I also don't think it matters if you ever get it working. I mean, it'd be great if you did, and I'm sure you would like it to work very, very much. But the point of actually doing it is more important than the end result. I mean, if you really need some 3D printing done, you know, you'll go find a 3D printer already set up, ready to go. That's not why you build a 3D printer. You know, that's not why you build anything. It's for the sake of actually doing it. Otherwise, I mean, if you want to listen to a really great guitar solo, you can go buy a bunch of music. On the other hand, if you're just trying to learn to play guitar, you're not expecting to, you know, blast off a great solo. But that's not the point. Are you saying the journey is the reward? I am saying the journey is the reward, and it's supposed to be fun. You know, this is a big problem with, you know, teaching kids anything, is if it's not fun, then it sucks and it's boring. I actually did a pick on this show a few episodes back, um, but I'm going to go ahead and bring it up here again. Uh, It was a blog article I really enjoyed about this dad who basically handed his, uh, I think it was a a son, but his child, uh, his three-year-old, a Linux laptop, and they just, like, booted into a shell, and he... And the dad made simple uh, shortcuts, you know, for like type blue and it'll change the terminal blue or type this and you can play this game or whatever. And just started teaching them simply like that and kept working with them on up. I think when they were around five, he introduced 
start X to get into X windows and, and throw them into something like X monad, which we think of as like a killer geek tool that maximize our environment, you know, have all these windows that we can control. But actually, it's almost kind of a minimal GUI, right? And then it takes off a lot of the the GUI trappings and it concerns itself with things like where windows go and stuff like that. And it was just this really cool story about how these simple things, doing these simple things can be a, a gentle on-ramp to, uh, you know, getting into stuff like this. Yeah. It's cool stuff. The, well, the, Linux right there, just Linux. We should be... Also, that kid... You know, flash forward to that kid in like 10 years, right? 15 years old, like has a gray beard down to their knees and knows more about Bash than all of us collectively. Like, how yeah. did this happen? Oh, yeah, my, my dad gave me a Linux laptop when I was five. You know, and, yeah. uh, and so part of that is just the freedom and flexibility. But kids are smarter than we think. Kids are smarter than we are. You know, all these artificial barriers, there was a great story, not last year, but the previous year about and I think it was last year, uh, the one laptop per child team, they were trying to work on their out-of-box experience. So they had a bunch of them that they had put into cardboard boxes and brought to a remote village somewhere in Africa. Stop me if you've heard this story. But they gave out these boxes and they had disabled the camera because they didn't have, you know, the software that they thought needed to... There was some reason why they had disabled the camera. So they, but they didn't give out, there was no instruction manuals, there was nothing. They just gave out these, you know, OX laptops to these kids. So they came back in two months and they basically just figured out on their own with no documentation or anything exactly how they could get this camera to work. So these kids, little kids hacked the camera into operation when it had already been disabled by these researchers and caught the researchers entirely by surprise, you know, because they were trying to experiment with something else. So I don't think we should underestimate the intelligence of any human being. Yeah. Regardless of their age. I got to tell you this, this story uh, on that. A dad said to me not too long ago, a few weeks or, or maybe a few months ago, it was just one of the best things I ever heard. It was like, yeah, I blocked the internet for my daughter because, you know, blah, blah, blah reasons, right? But he said, but I left the SSH port open to my Raspberry <laughs> Pi, which then you can get out to the rest of the internet. And he's all, if she figures that out, I'm totally cool with that. <laughs> yeah. What's really funny is that dad thinks that he has controlled the only access to the internet for that person. Right, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. And those of us who have kids are laughing. We're like, oh, no. uh -huh. yeah, yeah, you had the door. Front door was locked. They just went out the back door like, mm -hmm. you know, any other good kid. <laughs> well, that's Crawled down the trellis. That's, that's one is... of the things that I seriously hope I, I encounter with my kids is we're going to put controls in place, and I hope, I sincerely hope, that they find ways of circumventing those. Yeah. And, then, and then we can sit down and we can say, okay, well, now that you're persistent enough to get around it, we're going to talk about how to be responsible, you know, with the processes that you've picked up and responsible with the internet. Do it in the opposite order, Chuck. Talk yes. about responsibility first that. so that when they do crack it, you can go, very good, Grasshopper. You have stolen the pebble from my hand. You can now leave the monastery. <laughs> All right, true story. All right, true story. My oldest son uh, really, really loves online gaming, and uh, he discovered uh, some big multi-user online game that's very popular in Korea uh, some years back, and of course, it's all through in-game purchases. So I was working in my separate home office room, and I see an email come through PayPal that purchases uh, points in this online game system. I'm like, oh, that's very weird. I didn't purchase any points in this online game system. Huh, there's only one person in this house I know who plays. It happens to be my older son. So I go in there and I say, so, uh, I just saw a purchase come through PayPal from this, uh, from this game. And he just immediately his head just bows down, looks down like he's like staring at the ground, like he's completely caught. Uh huh. So, uh, I give him the grilling and it turns out he shoulder surfed my PayPal password. <laughs> so I was, 
I mean, it was an incredibly conflicted moment. On the one hand, I'm like, he is a hacker like his father before him, but oh man, like lucky it wasn't his friend's parents PayPal. Like, I know, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Else, you know, it's like, dad, dad, like, we all, you have visiting hours are over, son, you gotta go now. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah, like, like, like that's any different from slipping a few bucks out of your dad's wallet yeah, yeah, yeah. while he's watching yeah. the game. Yeah. Well, you well, have to yeah, be smart that, enough. It's exactly the same, except <laughs> for the consequences. Yeah, right? that would have that would have been capital punishment in our house. <laughs> uh, that would have been sufficient, uh, you know. But when there's a three leather acronym agency asking you questions, all of a sudden, you know, yeah. things are a lot different. So the things that we did as we were kids, which I mean, I was really scared of the police when I was a kid. But it's not for the reason you think. It's because they might catch me and take me home and tell my mom what I had done. <laughs> they did that to me. <laughs> I wasn't scared of the police themselves. I was really scared that they would tell my mom and there was no way I was getting out of it because there was yeah. no way I was going to deny it in front of the police. That's so, hilarious. you know, that's a lot different than now. You know, I don't know if you've read the acceptable use at your kid's elementary school, but basically, you know, they can fine you, you know, a very large sum of money if, you know, your kid does something at the school computer lab, like, that they consider bad, of which it's a fairly long list and kind of ambiguous, so... I've broken almost every item on that list at my <laughs> school, I'm pretty sure. Hey, yeah. hey, hey, hey Ron, I got a, I got a little uh, different question for you here. So, Paul Graham got a little bit of heat recently. He posted this... Uh, screed about female founders and one of the things he said was i don't know how to get girls interested in programming uh, you know because he was talking about the pipeline and why aren't there he any- just doesn't know how to get girls you know that's, <laughs> well, and, well, and i mean this and what i mean by that specifically is he's looking at everything in terms of himself and what's going to satisfy him you know i read that article and like many of the but, but, screed on this topic well, then finish your question first. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let me let me focus my question here, which is: in your experience, do you have to get girls interested in programming compared <laughs> to boys? I thought uh, Ron Jeffries, who I, I really respect, uh, many of the voices of reason are older voices in our community. We should listen to them. He said, "We don't need to get more women interested in programming. We need to get more people. If they happen to be women, great." And yeah. you know, I thought that was. From a one abstract point of view, that was, you know, that was right on. But from another point of view, it sort of denies certain basic realities about, right. you know, the environment the in which we're operating in. Yeah, exactly. You know, so, yeah. you know, one solution is to just throw up your hands and say, oh, the future will all let it work out someday. Well, it took 200 years to get the civil rights thing worked out for voting. And even that's still a little ambiguous some places. So I would like to think that we, engineers can apply a little social engineering Mm -hmm. that if we want to get certain outcomes, there are a number of reasons why we might want to get more women involved with programming. It has to do with why we want to get more humans involved with programming of different kinds, as opposed to just the ones, you know, people of color, transgender people who are people not associated with programming at all. I mean, people were very down on the programmer thing because Mm -hmm. that represented a sort of negative behavior but on the other hand, it was sort of a victory of sorts for for geeks, and it was a sad statement of, we made it through the door, so now we're going to shoot down at everyone else. You're supposed to shoot up, not down. Yeah. Right? You're supposed to aim your punches up, not down. So nice. I think we do have a responsibility to do something. I think there are things that we can do. You know, I was sorry run, that run, the run, science run. of it, though, can't be discussed. You know, when Larry Summers gave his famous speech, which was probably very poorly delivered, I didn't hear the actual speech, but I read uh, some excerpts from it, and it did bring up the fact that there's not a lot of good, solid scientific research done on why we don't have more women in programming. But guess what? There is some. So what is some of it that we've learned? Well, guess what? Uh, One of the places they did some really good research was Carnegie Mellon, which I believe had the first robotics program at any university. I, I met a great female roboticist from Carnegie Mellon recently, and that reminded me of the research that they had done, which was they asked this question, why do we not have more female computer science graduates, even of the ones who enter mm-hmm. with the intentions of obtaining a degree, a larger number failed to matriculate versus their male counterparts. Sure. So, sure. Uh, so one uh, of the yeah, things that they had learned was 
a lot, one of the factors was that those females who had previous experience doing programming of any kind had a much greater propensity to survive the rigors of an undergraduate computer science degree. And it didn't matter so much the quantity of it, even going to something like a coder dojo or even a one day thing like a kid's code camp was sometimes enough to help dispel the imposter syndrome of I can't do this versus the I've done this before, so I must be able to do it now. So there are things that we can do collectively. You know, Paul's bigger point was if we want, you know, was I think something we didn't even discuss, which was, is this even such a good thing at all? Like, should we be trying to get everyone to start their own companies and become rich and make Paul money? Should we perhaps be uh, so the answer trying to that to... is no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but so, so Ron, I mean, this, this is a lot of good stuff you've been talking about. I want to back up just a little bit because you haven't actually answered the question that I asked, which is, do you have to do extra work to make girls interested in programming? I mean, are, are girls just as interested in programming as oh, boys? Girls are, well, I um, mean, I'll, I'll give you a couple of personal examples. One of the first uh, kids code camps that we did, there was a uh, young programmer, female, she had uh, read about half of Chris Pine's Learn to Program already before coming to the camp. And uh, she was very, very impressive and also had really good posture as she uh, held her hand up to ask questions, perfectly behaved. I think that there are definitely physiological differences between male and female brain. We see consistently that girls have a lot greater capacity to sit still and focus. And they certainly have a lot more linguistic capability. I've seen consistently that girls do extremely well in these programming classes. Girls who don't necessarily have programming experience, but they have a tremendous attention span and they're genuinely interested. You know, I don't think that that is the problem. Katie Haggerty just gave, um, 11 year old Katie Haggerty just gave the, one of the keynotes at the Ruby conference in Miami. And it was amazing. Actually, the, it was called My Kids Ruby Journey. And uh, I cried, you know, not like sobbing, crying, but, but it brought tears to my eyes just because, you know, there's my new boss. Literally, like that is, if this is, if even as a uh, open source project, if Kids Ruby is intended to serve our customers, well, there's customer number one. But I don't think we need to do special things to attract girls into programming. I think what we need to do is make a special effort to keep them there. I think that girls have every bit, if not more, capability at a younger age to do extremely well at high ability, concentrated tasks that require that kind of thinking. But I think that we, all the social structure around it, and that's our behavior, and then the behavior that is going to be mirrored by the way that we act, I think that's the part that we need to do something about. I don't think we need to, you know, dumb down programming for girls, nothing of the sort. But I think we need to control our behavior and create new social structures which encourage them to stay in programming. Okay, I'm, I'm satisfied with that answer. <laughs> I, 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 have, I have one more question. I know we're, we're like, way over time. Uh, but... Uh, I, this is the question I've, I wanted to ask before the show even started, which is... I'm how sorry, do, we got to go, Josh. Thanks. Just okay, kidding. we'll get you next time. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, like I said, I got, I got, you know, my sister's kids, you know, they're very interested in learning to program. Uh, they live in Pittsburgh. I don't, you know, I don't live in Pittsburgh anymore. You know, how do we find programs for teaching kids? You know, I, I know that there's these code camps, there's all sorts of other, st- you know, hackathons and, and teaching events going on. Is there a directory of these that somebody maintains or, you know, how, how do you go about finding that stuff? You know, how, what do I tell my sister? Well, that's, that's one of the things Coder Dojo really did right is to create sort of a distributed community as opposed to a centralized one. You know, and, and we have tried to encourage this with kids code camp, but we didn't do all of the, We didn't do all the work that Coder Dojo has done to package it up and make it easier. 
you know, but they have curriculum and they also have a directory of to coder dojos. So starting your own coder dojo is really nothing more than, you know, registering your local affiliate. And that makes it possible for those who are interested, both as volunteers and also those with kids, you know, to find these local resources. I mean, there are, you can't teach programming if you don't know how to program. So we need actual programmers to stand up and be counted. We can't, it's, you know, similar to what Paul Lockhart wrote about in his fantastic paper, A Mathematician's Lament, which if you care about education and programming directly applies uh, to what we're talking about here, you know, taking something amazing and beautiful and artistic and fun like mathematics and making it boring and pedantic and nobody wants to learn it. How do you screw things up that badly? You know, Lockhart really got into that very well in this short but amusing and sad it's both amusing and sad, but I think there's a lot of lessons for us to learn, you know, in terms of programming. So this is one of the things that Coder Dojo has really done right. You know, the same thing that we were trying and have been trying to do with Kids Code Camp. It's all about the programming community getting involved, not just saying, hey, teachers, go teach programming. They're like, programming? How's that? You know, I don't know how to program. Well, you're not going to be a very good programming teacher, not because you have a lack of intentions, but because it's really hard to teach violin if you don't play violin. Okay. Well, cool. So the, the summary on that is I should tell my sister to go look at the Coder Dojo stuff. Is that the place where she should start? Yeah. Coder Dojo is a, is a great resource. Uh, code.org also has links to a lot of local groups. You know, those, those are the two most active communities who are strictly involved in the uh, nonprofit area, which is what I'm mostly interested in. And those like are good for children starting at about what age? I don't think that they're limiting the age at which there are different programs within them that are definitely oriented towards particular age groups. You know, I mean, there are certainly outliers. Actually, okay. one of our, but, one of but our like contributors. Grade school. Grade school would be okay. Yeah. I mean, elementary, upper elementary is a great place to get started. Cool. You know, anything there and above, it works really well. We actually have a contributor, the kids Ruby, who's in uh, middle school. Theron Borner, uh, we met him at uh, Kids Code Camp a couple of years ago uh, in Austin, and uh, he kept bothering us uh, with questions, <laughs> right? Which is uh, kind of like the story of my life, like keep asking questions, and they keep answering them, and they don't get too sick of you. So uh, he actually, right before Katie Haggerty's keynote, he Theron had become one of the commit rights contributors to Kids Ruby, and uh there's a, these are serious commits. They're not just like a little textual change, even though we'll take anything. So uh, there's always going to be the outliers who are, you know, in middle school and, you know, could be CTO of, uh, <laughs> of most early stage companies, frankly. But it, at the younger ages, there are resources for every age. It doesn't matter whether it's games like Robot Turtles or activities, like some of the group activities I was describing earlier or all the way up to the more structured things like Lego First Robotics, any age group that you decide to get involved, there will be some activities for them to play with. And play is underrated, right? You know, fun, the power of fun. You know, when you're playing, your mm -hmm. mind is the most engaged. And we all use this term all the time ourselves. We say, oh, uh, so have you been, you know, have you tried Angular JS? Oh, well, I played with it. What does that mean? That means I'm not expected to be serious, but I am trying it out. You know, it's a way of alleviating the cognitive stress associated with doing something you don't actually know how to do yet. At some point later, someone says, are you still playing with Angular JS? No, I'm actually doing something with it now. Or I moved on to, you know, Ember JS or whatever it is that your response is. You know, we need to give kids a chance to play not just like playtime as something else to do when they're not studying, but as a first class activity. I just wanted to say for the, um, you know, the different things for different levels, we're starting to see quite a few resources for, I'm thinking they're probably for teenagers more, but we're starting to see things like programming books specifically targeted at kids or uh, activities that kids often enjoy uh, just looking through the prize list here for a couple of seconds, I found a 
3D game programming for kids, which, by the way, uses JavaScript. And I, I, you know, being a big Ruby guy, it's funny that I should say JavaScript, but I think JavaScript has the advantage of being one of those easy on-ramp things because everybody's got a browser, right? So, um, you know, it, it's not the... You have to install, you know, 50 things plus Xcode to get everything going kind of stuff. Anyways, I saw that book. Uh, another one was the new one from Andy about uh, making Minecraft plugins, uh, which is a great uh, on-ramp, right? You've already got the game, then you're just building some tie-ins to do things that you're going to have really good interactive feedback on, you know, like Flying Creepers is one of the subtitles of the book, and I just think things like that are probably pretty good resources, again, for, you know, a little bit older, or if you have a parent that's willing to work through it with you, you know, or something, you could probably do it even younger. There's definitely tons of resources out there these days. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Minecraft is programming. It's a kind of visual programming, but, I mean, somebody built an ALR with Minecraft. I mean, there is enormous sophistication so don't, you know, a bunch of the younger people at Hybrid Group all started programming by way of, you know, doing mods and macros, uh-huh. you know, where like our age group, we started more with the basic prompt, you know, but it was the same idea, which is I could get in and, and change things and, you know, going to JavaScript for a minute. In many ways, JavaScript is a great programming language because they can go into a web page of a site they already use and see the JavaScript and even, you know, change it and, you know, execute it right in their browser, Yeah. you know, the same as they change their CSS. They're so like, whoa, I just hacked this web page. Yep. Well, not by the cracker definition, but we don't want them doing that anyway. The point was more that they just learned that they have a lot more power than they thought. And mm-hmm. a lot of these ideas are empowering thought itself of taking a thought and well, we taught you programming as a way of carrying that thought and of actually implementing that thought into something concrete. You could do the same exact thing with any thought in any genre of the human experience. It doesn't matter whether it's a sculpture. It doesn't matter whether it's a new political construct. It doesn't matter whether it's a movie. It doesn't matter what it is. You can create something from your thought, but there is a series of tangible steps in order to do so in the decomposition and recomposition process. And that kind of thinking is what Papert really wanted to teach, not just programming of itself. Yeah. So we really need to get to pick soon, but just one last thing I want to say before we shut this off. We talked a little bit about the physical kinds of programming and and robotics, and we'll definitely get Ron back to talk about all that. But as a teaser, you should really go and watch his talk at uh, Gogoruko this year. Uh, where he showed flying robots, Spheros moving around, Spheros playing the game of life, uh, super cool stuff. Uh, and, and it's hard not to watch that and, and get excited about uh, messing with physical kinds of programming. So I think we'll just close on that. If nobody has anything else, can we do picks? Let's do picks. Sounds right. good. Josh, can you start us off? Sure, sure. Although, although technically that was last year's Gogoruko. Sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, speaking of last year's Gogoruko, there's this new website up there, rubyconferences.org. Um, I'm not sure that we need a Ruby conference directory, but since it's up there, I figure I'll just point people at it. <laughs> that, you know, it, it could actually be very handy for the community to have something a little more targeted than uh, going on Lanyard and looking for conferences. So uh, thanks, guys, for putting that up. I hope it becomes a useful resource. And then I have a, since we're talking about teaching children to program, there's a, a hilarious uh, video of a talk that I saw recently about infantapulting, uh, which what? is... Uh, <laughs> Please tell me that means what I think it means. It means exactly what you think it means. Yes! <laughs> so, um, I know, the uh, yes. kid's a little angel. Look, he's got wings. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the... Zach Wiener Smith, the guy who does Saturday morning breakfast yes. cereal cartoons, <laughs> uh, it, it's like this, uh, you know, ten ten minute talk, you know, which is hilarious and it's completely uh, satirical. But the thing that I love about it is that the it's a really great exemplar for how to do a good technical talk. 
and it's just like hilarious and engaging too. So it's like everybody who wants to give a talk, go watch this. That's awesome. So yeah, and, and so there's I put a link to YouTube up there. It's from the uh, Ba Fest, which uh, I don't know what Ba means. <laughs> it sh- shows how useful I am. Cool. So th- that's it for me. Awesome, David, you're up. Howdy. Uh, I've got three picks today. Uh, the first one is uh, a book called Play, How It Shapes the Brain, Opens the Imagination, and Invigorates the Soul by uh, the people who wrote it, Stuart Brown <laughs> and, Chris- and Christopher Vaughn. Sorry, I looked away, and when I looked back, I couldn't see where the author's name was on the page. I'll be up front. I've only read one chapter in this, but it's the chapter where they basically say there's like eight different ways that people tend to play. Like there are people, and we all tend to have like a dominant mode, and then the very playful people have several subordinate play modes. And so, as you can imagine, I am a person with a dominant mode, which is the Joker. I love being the class clown. But I have several subordinate modes, like Explorer, and I can't remember the other ones, but the, there's the one that I'm not is competitive. And a lot of people are very competitive as their dominant uh, mode of play. And so if you've ever wanted to know the mechanics of how things are played with or how you play with things and why play is fantastically good for you, if you want to be smarter, better, gooder at what you do and maybe language too, then play is uh, a really good way to do this. And Honestly, the first chapter of the book is like an apologist manifesto for MDs and PhDs trying to study play and how they've had to like retitle their, you know, they have to talk about like uh, discretional, you know, di- diversional use of discretional time, you know, as the title of their thesis, because if they say I'm studying play, there's like pushback from the scientific community that that's not real study. And no, actually it is. It's real study and it's, and it's turns out to be really, really important. So that's my first pick is play. My second one is absolutely inspired by, I thought of this during today's uh, episode when Ron, you mentioned that uh, several million dollars in unclaimed uh, scholarships go by every single year. There's also several million or I want to say billion, but that's probably uh, an exaggeration, but there's millions and millions of dollars of grant money from the government that goes unclaimed every single year. And when I was much younger, there was this crazy, crazy guy named Matt Lesko who would do these like late night infomercials. And he, he wears these ridiculous suits covered in question marks like the Riddler. And uh, I think the reason he does it basically is his, his entire motto is if you just go ask, you will be astonished with what you can find. And if you go to the public library and just look for Matt Lesko he, you you will find basically like a phone book that he puts out every year. And I'm talking like a New York City phone book, like three inches thick on just newsprint. And all it is is a directory of you look up your financial and psycho, not psycho, well, actually some of it's psychological, but you look up your your demographic, right? You know, you're a, a whatever you are, a, a, you know, a perfect example of being you. And you look yourself up in this book that, you know, I'm in a rural community, I'm in a poor, my parents make this much money, I'm a white male, or I'm, you know, a Hispanic female. And you flip to that section of the book, and it's page upon page upon page of grants that you can just apply for, and it's the addresses and and who you talk to. And it turns out, he's still doing it, and he's still around. So I'm glad that I'm not, like, out of touch. He's got a lot more gray hair now, but if you go to lesco.com, He's still doing it, and um, it looks like a crazy late-night infomercial. Um, you know, like, get all the government benefits you deserve is the, the current headline title. It lo- just looks ridiculous, but this man helped me pay for some of my college. So he's the real deal, and there's all kinds of stuff in there. If you're, you know, the current newsletter is 50 programs for busy moms. So, like, if you're a single mom, you need to be checking this guy out. So Matt Lesko is my second pick. And my third pick, I didn't get the chance to shill my book at the top of the show, so I just want to say that I am still writing the job replacement guide. That's three straight weeks of me working on the same thing. So just from an ADD standpoint, I think this book really has potential. I guess the one thing that I would say about it this uh, on this show is that I'm getting a lot of people signing up that are out of work and desperate to replace their job. But I'm also getting some sign-ups from people that 
are unhappy with their current job. And I want to make it very, very clear that this book is for both sets of people. So if you want to be prepared for needing to replace your job, go for it. This is absolutely the book that will prepare you for it. So if you've ever had to put up with a boss that pisses you off, this is the book that will let you say, you know what, I don't have to put up with this because it will calm you down about uh, the terrifying prospect of unemployment. So them's my picks. Um, I think that was a pretty good, uh, in the back channel, James says, this is not a David record yet. And uh, I could probably vamp for about six more minutes and reach my best time <laughs> for picks, but I'm not going to. So them's my picks. Chuck fell asleep during David's pick, so we're going to skip him yep. this week. And <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, Chuck had to step out, uh, so uh, he's not here right now. But I have a couple of picks I want to do really quick. I saw this great article from Chad Fowler. I read it just before coming on the show, uh, and it's so important. I feel like it had to be my main pick today. It's called Killing the Crunch Mode Anti-Pattern. And I believe in everything in this article about 110%. Uh, this is, I think, feel like a disease we have in the tech community. Um, and, uh, really focusing on, you know, controlling our, our work pacing and, uh, stuff like that. So please, please, please go read this article and spend some time thinking about it. And then when you have all that extra time, because you're not, uh, spending ridiculous amounts of time, uh, you know, working when you shouldn't be, uh, you'll have more chance to teach your kids Ruby, uh, which is great. That's My good. other J- pay- yeah. J- James, I, I just want to build it. I, I, I think that, you know, Chad had like two really good articles out. There was also his one on empathy that was really great. But the, but the, the crunch mode thing is, um, so Rob Me, founder of Pivotal Labs, said, if a neurosurgeon is like in your brain cutting around doing surgery and things get dicey and, you know, suddenly they got to, you know, d- you know, fix something. You don't want them throwing all of their discipline and standard practices out the window yeah. and just try anything that works or that they think might work, right? Yeah. That you want them to stick to their training and their discipline and you, and rely on that to get through the crisis. I may be wrong, but I think that it was actually Uncle Bob Martin who said that at a Rails. He said you know. when he keynoted at uh, RailsConf. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think. Yeah, I heard. I heard. I heard Rob say that first. Ah, interesting. So, so, cool. we, so we know. We know where Uncle Bob got that. Aha! Uh-huh. Right? <laughs> Excellent. Or well, maybe yes. they both got it from the same place, or who knows? Yep. Super, yeah. super important article. Please go read it. You owe it to yourself, really. Okay. Other pick is my wife and I have been watching. A new show on Netflix. Uh, well, a couple. Uh, one Avdi already picked, and that's how I found it, so I won't do that one right now. But the other one that we found recently is called Once Upon a Time, uh, and it's kind of a cool story about what happens if all the fairy tale characters end up in storybook Maine and, uh, and how all that uh, goes down. It's a cool show. It's pretty family-friendly, so you can probably watch it with your kids. And uh, good stuff. You should check it out. And those are my picks. We're going to try to get some picks from Ron if we can get him back in here. <laughs> Hang on. So while we're bringing him in, James, I actually have a sticky note on my monitor that says exhaustion is not a status symbol. Exactly. And, and I actually got that from one of Brene Brown's books. She's the woman who did the vulnerability talk on or the TED talk on vulnerability. And I can't remember which book it's from. So go buy all of them. It's just my advice to you. Give us your picks, Ron. Well, um, my two favorite things, uh, one is OpenBCI, which is the Open Brain Computer Interface. It's a uh, Kickstarter project that just closed and completed their funding. A very, very cool physical interface between your brain and the computer using an EEG. So that looks really, really interesting. The other thing is Light Table from Brett Victor, a very radical and interesting way of visualizing and editing code. Um, they just pushed a new release about a week and a half ago. And there are a couple of different plugins for Lighttable to be able to edit Ruby code. So along with many other languages, looks really, really interesting and appears to be ready to start playing with. Didn't that also just go open source, if I remember right? Uh, yes, that is also correct. Awesome. Oh, yeah. I only mention things that are open source. <laughs> Awesome. I'm kind of prejudiced in that way. Very cool. Well, Ron, thank you so much for coming on the show and talking with us about this. Yes, it was thank a you. Great time. Yeah, hey, 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 Ron, sure. quick question. 
quick question. Are you, uh, do you have any appearances coming up? Are you speaking anywhere or where can people follow you? Wow. Well, um, I'm dead program on Twitter. Uh, that's how you can keep up with my activities. Uh, we have a lot of stuff coming up this year. Um, in February, we're doing a robot hackathon at the Los Angeles Ruby conference. Uh, we're then doing both a talk on robotics as well as doing a kids Ruby programming class at uh, the Southern California Linux Expo. Uh, that's uh, the biggest one of its kind um, in Southern California, usually about two or 3,000 people there. So that should be pretty great. When's that? Uh, that's also in February. Um, in March, we're going to be at Makerland in Poland, which is a theme park for makers with 3D printers and Arduinos and Raspberry Pis and robots and drones and us. So it's, uh, that's going to be really fun. Then in April, we're going to be at uh, GopherCon, which is the first conference for the Go programming language. Very interesting language if you haven't checked that out. Then in May, uh, we, I'm fortunate to have been invited to deliver the closing keynote at the Scottish Ruby Conference. So uh, see you there. Ooh. Awesome. All right. Well, um, that's our show. Please leave a review on iTunes if you enjoyed it and go out. Book club, book club, book club. Book club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are reading uh, Ruby Under a Microscope, an mm-hmm. illustrated guide to Ruby internals by Pat Shaughnessy. Super great book. And nobody can stop talking about it. So we're super excited to do it. And that will be in February, I think, late February. Is that right? Something like that. Uh, I don't have the date in front of me right now, but Mandy will put it in the show notes. Cool. So definitely grab a copy, start reading, uh, good stuff. And that's it. Please go out and spread programming throughout the young masses. Thanks. Bye-bye. Grab a kid and teach him something about programming. <laughs> or how to hijack cars, whichever one. You know, sure. Cars have computers in them. <laughs> Everything has computers now. Believe me, this skill will come in handy. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. Bye. 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 Thanks, everyone.